I'd like to introduce Dr Elizabeth Murray, uh, Certified Practicing Speech Pathologist, who is both a valued member of our teaching and research team here and also a local private practitioner. And she's going to be talking about her com combining of both of those roles. Thank you very much, Liz. Thanks, Tricia. It's an honour to be presenting tonight um, as part of Speech Pathology Australia Week, but also as part of the Speech Bites' 10th birthday celebrations. I've been part of the Speech Bite team now for the whole 10 years, um, and Speech Bite has been pivotal in my becoming um, a researcher as well as a clinician. So tonight what I'm sharing with, um, with you is my research of evaluating my private practice um, with the information that I learnt through doing my um, PhD in Childhood Approach of Speech, as Tricia um, has already said, and particularly looking at treatment intensity. So that tension between um, knowing what you should ideally be doing and then actually trying to work out, well, how do you do that in practice? So knowing that you should do, have greater treatment intensity in the sessions that um, we deliver, but also knowing that that's quite hard to do um, logistically. And I guess traditionally from the viewpoint of speech pathologists tend to give weekly services. So it's a problem that a lot of clinicians face and hopefully through sharing this information, you can get some ideas on how um, you, know, you might be able to do something similar. The other purpose of this talk is to show that clinical research that you do in your private practices or in your clinics is really valuable also in helping the speech pathology field move forward and know, knowing what's, what's actually valuable um, for our clients, not just stuff that's done in the lab. So as an introduction, I use the um, E3BP evidence-based practice framework to help me guide through this decision of what should I do with this dilemma of trying to um, faithfully um, do what's intended in the research evidence in a way that's practical in my service delivery model in my private practice. So for this, I looked at the external research evidence, so peer-reviewed journal publications, which is um, a source of the most unbiased information that we can have for decision making. Also looking at families' needs and preferences. And also internal research evidence from my own practice and experiences. So I'm going to talk through each of these three things as I go um, to show you how this fits and then also what my results were from all three perspectives. So external research evidence, here's a plug for speech bite, which we're going to hear a lot of tonight. Um, the first thing you obviously need to do is search for the relevant research um, research and external evidence. So um, SpeechBite, as Tricia said, is a database of research evidence aimed at treatment studies in, child, in, um, in speech pathology and childhood apraxia of speech, which is a disorder of motor planning and programming. So it affects children's ability to express and communicate what they want to say, um, is on there as part of that. Um, so SpeechBite collates um, all the relevant research from all the different um, databases you can search for, so CINAHL, um, PsychInfo, um, Medline, Embase, all of the ones that you could search for, all in one place to save speech pathologists time, and it's free. So here's the results of my search. So you can see I did an advanced search using um, key terms. Um, and the research results always come up with the highest level of evidence first. So I'm showing you here the systematic reviews, because systematic reviews are a really good place to start in getting other people's evaluations of the evidence, um, and then taking that and seeing um, what the answer to your question is, and then if there's any follow-up papers that you need to read additional to that. So through looking at that and predominantly basing this on two systematic reviews, which you saw in the slide before, um, the external research evidence shows that there's four treatments with promising external evidence for children with childhood apraxia of speech, or CAS. So these are dynamic temporal and tactile cueing, the Nuffield Dyspraxia Program 3rd edition, the rapid syllable transition treatment, and also integrated phonological awareness. My question is predominantly about treatment intensity, and guess what? The treatment intensity of all of these studies that have been published shows that they've all been delivered at least twice a week. 
So sometimes up to five times a week. But there is an absence of weekly therapy in any of the research evidence for children with childhood apraxia of speech. So at this point I'm thinking, oh, I don't really have a leg to stand on <laughs> in having my weekly services. So the childhood apraxia of speech intensity research concludes that two times um, sessions twice weekly um, is more effective than weekly. Um, also that treatment four times a week when using the rapid syllable transition treatment or rest versus two days a week was similar. So I could probably get away with two times a week. Um, that a minimum of 100 trials per session is indicated regardless of what childhood apraxia of speech treatment you provide. And that children can actually maintain and generalise their skills in breaks after therapy. So if you provide intensive therapy and services, they, and then a break afterwards, they will continue to improve in those breaks. So maybe there isn't a need for weekly ongoing services. So the clinical bottom line here from the external evidence is I'm aiming for two times a week services for six weeks and then a one month break. And that each session should have 100 trials. From a family perspective, um, a survey done by Reguero and colleagues showed that um, a lot of families are dissatisfied with weekly only services. The, uh, McCormack, have, McCormack and colleagues have shown that ch parents of children with um, childhood apraxia of speech are saying they're always battling. They're always battling for recognition, for awareness, for services, for funding. Um, and I don't want to be part of you know, them having to battle another thing. There's also evidence to show that homework can be quite hard and that we need to factor in that children have other time needs. So therapy isn't the only thing they do. They have other activities, other therapies, and they also need time to just be kids. And then we also need to factor in financial cost. And so NDIS covers some children with childhood apraxia of speech, but not all children at this point. And so we need to factor in how can we actually make this economically viable as well. So the clinical bottom line here is that we really do need family-centred practice to determine what families want at any given time. And we need to be pre prepared for the fact that that might change over time. Um, in terms of the in internal clinician evidence, so the expert evidence in the field, we know that kids with childhood apraxia of speech need ongoing therapy. And when I say ongoing, I mean years and years and years. So it's not like you're, you're doing you know, a year's worth of therapy and you're stopping. They also need a range of other services, such as occupational therapy, sometimes physiotherapy, um, psychology perhaps. Um, so we need to factor that in. And then they also have long-term risk factors for literacy and learning difficulties, also mental health and occupational um, difficulties perhaps leading into adulthood. So the more we can do early um, to support these kids, the better. Um, there's a tension between the therapy schedules we have as trying to um, be efficient um, service delivery providers and also um, being able to provide the evidence. So weekly services kind of helps our administration of trying to keep everything kind of in line, everyone has a slot, it kind of works quite nicely, but that can be a barrier to evidence-based practice itself. So my previous speech pathology private setting was I work at the University of Sydney two days a week, and so I work in private practice two days a week, and I don't really have much scope to move beyond that. Um, I see a range of clients, so I do see a lot of children with childhood apraxia of speech, but I also see a range of children with autism, language impairment, other speech sound disorders, stuttering. So I, I'm not just catering for childhood apraxia of speech, it's not just a CAS clinic. So I needed to make that work for everyone. So my clinical bottom line here is that we want to offer flexibility, however we also need to plan services efficiently also. There's no point trying to fit everyone in and then not get the intensity because you don't actually have places in your diary to book anyone. So my aim was to evaluate my new service delivery moving to two days a week using EB E3BP. So looking at the perspective of the external evidence, family perspectives and also the internal evidence again. So my new service delivery model, I provided kids with childhood apraxia of speech therapy two days a week. So as you can see here, they had a six-week block of two sessions a week, followed by six weeks off, and then a second block of kids started therapy while the first lot of kids were having their break. So that allowed me to see more clients and fit more people in that way. 
So this leads to a maximum of five blocks a year. And then I also had the scope to provide weekly therapy to the other clients with other communication problems where needed. As part of this, we did assessments in the first therapy session of each block, midway in the sixth therapy session, at the end of each block and the twelfth therapy session, and then at the start of the next block to check maintenance and generalisation. So evaluation, the child outcomes were from de-identified data from 10 children over a 12-month period. So all the therapy sessions they had over a 12-month period. Um, so here I calculated group means um, to protect their identity and then compared that to external evidence using one sample t-test. So look, looking back at the, ex the published literature and comparing the means from those papers to the means that I had from my data. Family perspectives and also the clinician perspectives were taken from a survey monkey questionnaire and all the families completed that questionnaire for me. So the children involved, there's 10 children as I said before, they aged, be they aged between 2 years 6 months and 6 years 10 months. As you can see here they had a range of other diagnoses. So it really is a clinical sample, not a sample that you'd, always, that you'd necessarily see in a research paper. They attended twice a week and their therapy blocks differed depending on their needs. So some kids only got two therapy blocks in that year, some kids got five, the full five therapy blocks that year and you can see that the treatments changed as their needs changed. So a lot of kids started off with DTTC, they moved on to the Nuffield treatment and then on to rest and then some of them went back to do DTTC towards the end when they needed some more assistance with specific articulation of sounds. So on to the results. So these are the children's outcomes. So here I have a graph of their treated item accuracy for, all, for the three treatments that I provided. So I, I combined all three treatments together. In the light blue is pre-treatment, in the yellow is mid-therapy, in the light green is post-therapy, so the 12th 12, the 12 session mark, and then the follow-up was the start of the next block. Um, so you can see here that for DTTC, the Nuffield and REST, there's, there's a nice upward trajectory for each one. So it's showing that some change did occur. But more importantly, how did it actually compare to the external research? So for DTTC, looking at the two articles that were most similar, there were no significant differences. So what they did in a more um, laboratory setting, I was able to replicate in my clinical practice. For Nuffield, the same thing happened, so there were no significant differences between my data and the data that was in the published paper that I have to disclaim I was part of with my um, PhD team, Tricia and Kiri. Um, but the main difference here is that in our randomised control trial, we provided services four days a week, and in my, in my private practice, I'm only providing services two days a week. But we still got comparable results, so I find that quite exciting. And then for the rest treatment, I compared it to the published study by Donna Thomas and her colleagues that looked at doing rest two times a week, so similar service delivery. And there, were not, there was no significant differences early on, but there was a significant difference at follow-up. So my sample um, actually generalised, um, sorry, maintained their skills a little bit better than the published research in that area. So again, encouraging results. In terms of the children's outcomes when it came to generalisation, so here I'm graphing their accuracy for non for non-targeted words and phrases, so things that we didn't directly work on, and again, just like the research suggested, there can be change through therapy, and then also change um, between the end of therapy and when you review them again. So having those breaks, those consolidation breaks, isn't necessarily a bad thing. And you can see that all, all three of them had similar change. Family perspectives. Um, so I asked parents what their preferred service delivery was after all of this. So 60% um, of them said that they um, prefer, they were happy with two times a week. 
Two families still felt like that they wanted more services, they would prefer blocks of four days a week, and two families felt like they'd like to go back to weekly sessions. So it was a mixed bag, but the majority felt like the two days a week was working. The themes from the, quant the qualitative data of what we found was that the families really felt like the breaks gave them more family time. So rather than kind of feeling like therapy was a constant in their life, they kind of had times where they could focus and really get into their speech work and then have times where they actually had some time to just be kids and do other things. They felt like there was greater communication between block, um, during blocks so, and they felt more secure in where they were headed. So I think the reviews really helped with that. So starting off a therapy block, working out what their goals were, what therapy we were going to provide, all of those things initially, and then seeing where they were going from there. And all families said they had high or very high satisfaction with the treatments provided. From a clinician perspective, so this is my perspective now, um, I found that most of the preparation here was done at the starter blocks. So obviously if you're doing your review assessment and then you're having to set goals, work out what treatment you're going to provide, most of that work is done at the start of blocks. Um, but then throughout blocks it was actually fairly easy because you've already set it up quite well. Um, I did find there was better family involvement and less unable to attend to sessions, which was good. Um, and overall I felt like there were great outcomes on average, which the data actually supported which was nice. It's always hard when you put yourself out there and you're not quite sure what the data says when you get all the individual data points and then put them into group means. So that was, that was good to see. Um, I feel like there needs to be more flexibility regarding the duration of therapy blocks. So some kids who met um, the accuracy targets quite early probably could finish earlier than 12 sessions, but some of the kids that needed um, greater time to, to build up their accuracy probably needed longer therapy blocks and I feel like that's something that I need to look into. However, scheduling clients was and still is a bit of a logistical nightmare because you've, I've kind of got this tight timeline of six weeks on, six weeks off, six weeks on, six weeks off. But if someone's sick or if they can't attend something, there's not a lot of flexibility there. So next time I do this, I'm thinking of moving to a maximum of four blocks a year to allow some buffers around each block to then allow for greater time to do some of those assessments and um, some of that preparation without trying to do everything at the same time. Um, and I do feel like there needs to, I, I still need to fit in more communication with the other health professionals for my individual clients. So in terms of my future clinical practice, I personally wouldn't go back to weekly services. Um, I, I don't have data to show the difference between my weekly services and my two days a week services because there were different kids and it was, it was quite hard to do. But, you know, the, the evaluation I did showed that it's working quite well. Um, the majority of people are quite happy. And I, I just feel, I, when I was doing weekly services, sometimes you kind of think, gosh, where, am, I, am I getting somewhere? Whereas I don't have that feeling as much now when I'm doing two times a week. Um, there's lots of different future research needs coming out of this. So we need more clinical data on weekly services. Um, we don't have a lot of it, yet we do a lot of it in practice. So that's where our clinical practices can really start filling some of those holes. And I'm sure if there is anyone who has um, some research that they'd like to do, anyone on the Discipline of Speech Pathology team would be pleased to talk to you about that and help you with that. Um, we want, I also think there's some more room for integrating other services, streamlining therapy systems to make it easier to, to do the administration that goes along with this. And obviously there's a need for replication um, across, so other people doing similar things to me in their clinics to show that, you know, there isn't a clinician, um, you know, factor or something in this and that actually it is doable um, for speech pathologists more generally. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, particularly um, after work, and I'd be pleased to answer any of your questions at the end of today's session. Okay, so if we have one or two questions right now, Liz is happy to answer them. I'm conscious of trying to keep us moving on so that uh, we get closer to the wine, but uh, yes. Come back to the microphone so it gets recorded. Sure. 
Okay, so the question was, what were the length of sessions um, that the children were provided? It varied based on the actual treatments that I provided. So I did try and keep that faithful to the actual treatments. So um, DTTC I provided in half an hour sessions, um, particularly as most of the kids that got DTTC were quite little. So half an hour is kind of a good t period of time for them. Um, the Nuff Field was provided in 45 minute sessions with a strict 15 minutes for each goal. So when you do the Nuff Field um, treatment, you should, have th you should choose three goals to work on at any given time. And so 15 minutes strictly for each of the three goals each session. Um, and then the rest treatment I did, um, depending on the child and how fast they'd get through their 100 trials, um, between 45 minutes and an hour sessions. Great question. Yeah, good question. So the question was, how much additional time did I have to provide to services for these children? So including things like liaising with other health professionals, planning for sessions, setting goals, that kind of thing. Um, initially, initially there was quite a lot. Um, like whenever there's a new client, you always spend more time, um, you know, talking to other um, service providers, trying to get your head around who this child is and how to help them um, the best you can. Um, but then I found that, particularly as I was doing three treatments and I was using them fairly frequently, I could set up some of those systems. So I have data sheets for each treatment that are ready to go. Um, I have, because I did my PhD in two of those treatments, I had kind of therapy targets and stuff kind of worked out beforehand. So that made it easier for me. There wasn't that kind of learning curve of having to learn the treatments plus also adjust to the new service delivery and intensity change which I realised would be different for other clinicians. Um, the, the preparation time in the first week of blocks is, is quite a lot because you've got lots of kids starting all at once. But then, as I said, after that, you've pretty much got everything sorted and the rest of the blocks goes pretty smoothly.